Seated. It is my privilege to do the welcome this morning. Welcome everyone to Emmanuel. I take great pleasure in welcoming you to the house of God. Emmanuel, God is with us. We have here as our first time visitors, Brother Yuna and Brent Turner. Will you please stand? Sister M. Chapman. Welcome to Emmanuel. She comes all the way from Jamaica with the Highland Breeze. We appreciate you. We welcome you. Welcome again. Sister Sindel, welcome again. Okay, we still welcome you. Sister McCullough, Sister McCullough, welcome to Emmanuel all the way from Jamaica. We welcome you. Sister Sonia M Martin. Welcome, sister. We appreciate you. Welcome again to Emmanuel. And we have others who have visited us before, Brother Earl Jeremiah. We welcome you again and again and again. Sister Juliet, we welcome you again and again and again. <laughs> and our speakers, we welcome you to Emmanuel. So we welcome our third time visitors as well, fourth, fifth, sixth, and all the time visitors. Please accept our sincere welcome from my Emmanuel family to you and yours. We are going to greet each other in Jesus' name. It is a special day at Emmanuel, a special that we are celebrating Father's Day. Our father, who we're named after, Emmanuel, dwells in this place. Happy birthday to our earthly fathers. And those who are here now, we're going to ask you to stand, accept. Happy birthday, greetings from us. Happy Father's Day, greetings. You see, I'm looking at two things. Those are birthday and those are Father's Day. So pardon me, I'm not that young anymore. Happy Father's Day to all our fathers. Will you please stand, fathers? Fathers are to represent God in the home as a priest. So as you set an example for your young ones, remember, look up to Jesus Christ because he's the greatest example of all. Our Father has instilled through him the perfect example that fathers should follow and guide your children and teach them the principles and precepts of God. Remember, you're a soldier in the army of God. And if you were in the army in a country, you will obey the chief commander. And Jesus Christ is our chief commander. So remember, always look up to him. May God bless you all.
Time now for our call to worship. Our call to worship is taken from Psalms 37, 1 to 6, and it's in the back of your bulletin, and it will be on the screen. And then we'll have our affirmation of faith. It will be taken from Exodus 28 to 11 and St. John 3, 16 and 17. And we go ahead in the back of your bulletin. Psalms 37. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou not thy son, not thy daughter, nor thy man servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gate. For in six days the Lord made the heaven the earth, and sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and all of it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And with that, we have this book. for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this occasion. Thank you so much for allowing us to come out together today. Bless us today as we receive this word. Fill up our minds, fill up our empty vessels with a knowledge of self, with a knowledge of financial help that can be used not only for ourselves, but for those individuals around us as well. Bless us all. Bless the speaker today. And may we take what we hear and share it with others. This we do ask and pray. Amen.
there was a holy hush all over as I walked into the room. As I stood before him face to face, I was gloriously made There was a great and awesome presence and a light as bright as day. And as I bowed to me, I bow to kneel with the angels. I can hear the Spirit say, All oh, rise, all oh, rise. As we stand before His throne in the presence of the Holy One, all oh, rise. the Messiah, singing holy, 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 worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was and is and is to come. He is the great I am. All rise, all rise, as we stand before his throne in the presence of the Holy Well, hopefully by the end of the story, I get to change your mind. Okay. A small congregation in the foothills of great, in the Great Smoky Mountains in the USA built a new church on a piece of land left to them by a church member in his will. Ten days before the new church was to open, the local building inspector informed them that the vicar, that the parking lot was too small for the size of the building. Until the church doubled the size of the parking lot, they would not be able to use the new sanctuary. Unfortunately, the church with its small parking lot 
had used every inch of their land except for the mountain against which it had been built. In order to build more parking spaces, they would have to move the mountain out of the bar backyard. The pastor announced the next Saturday morning that he would meet tomorrow evening with all the members who had mountain moving faith. They would hold a prayer session asking God to remove the mountain from the backyard and to somehow provide enough money to have it paved and painted before the scheduled opening dedication service the following week. At the appointed time, 24 of the congregation's 300 members assembled for prayer. They prayed for nearly three hours. At 10 o'clock, the pastor said the final amen. We'll open next Saturday as scheduled, he assured everyone. God has never let us down before, and I believe he will be faithful this time too. The next morning, as he was working in his study, there came a loud knocking at his door. When he called come in, a rough-looking construction foreman appeared, removing his hard hat as he entered. Excuse me, Pastor, I'm from the Acme Construction Company over in the next county. We're building a huge new shopping mall over there, and we need some dirt fill. Would you be willing to sell us a chunk of that mountain behind the church? We'll pay for you for the dirt we remove and pave all exposed area free of charge, if we can have it right away. We can't do anything else until we get the dirt in and allow it to settle properly. The little church was dedicated the next Saturday as originally planned, and there were far more members with mountain moving faith on opening Saturday than there had ever been the previous week. All right. In Matthew 17, verse 20, it says, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Okay, so the moral of the story is, if you have faith this small, you can do anything with God's help, okay? Would anybody like to pray for me today? Yay, come on. I can come too. All right, ladies first, Preston. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for my mommy, my daddy. Thank you for my brother. Thank you for my cousin. Thank you for my auntie. Thank you for my uncle. Thank you for my grandma and my grandpa. Thank you for everybody. Thank you for my church. Thank you for me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for my mommy and my dad and my cousin and my uncle and my grandma and my grandpa. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for my mommy. Thank you for my daddy. Help everybody in this world. Thank you for everybody in this world. Thank you for everything in this world. Help everything in this world. Bless us. Keep us safe. Amen. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ruth. For our scripture reading, Ruth 1, verse 16. Please stand as we have our scripture reading. Verse says, Ruth, and Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after thee. Whether thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. The Lord had the richest blessing to the reading of his words. Good morning, church. We don't sound like we are in church. We come to praise the Lord. We should be lifting up the highest praise to God today. We are not in the mark. We are not in the nursing home. We are not in the hospital. So our praise should be high giving God thanks that we are alive and we are in his house today. Amen? 
I am wondering when we come to the house of the Lord, we just relax. And sometimes even the preacher have to beg for an amen. Beautiful songs sing. And we can't rejoice. Is it that the Lord has not been good to us? Surely, the Lord is good. We serve a great God, a wonderful God. When I watch the news and see what the enemy has been doing to God's people, we should be praising God more. We are no exceptional here at Emmanuel. Let us look up. Let us take our soul salvation serious, brother and sister. It's not time to play. It's time to serve the Lord. It's time to lift up the highest praise to him, to give him glory, because he's worthy of our praise. This morning we come into the house of the Lord. We come for a blessing. We come to seek more strength so that we can go and face the plan of the enemy. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Special that's coming up, Sister Mac. Something special because this church is special. Amen. So, something that is, is being planned that God will pour out his spirit upon us in a very special way. Yes. Can you tell us what that is that's coming up? Um... On the 18th of July, we'll be having a consecration service here at Emmanuel. Amen, amen. This church will be also dedicated over on that day. And so, for a special blessing that we need to receive here, we'd love you to come, those who are visiting with us today, and we'd love you to invite someone to come and join us on that special day. That will be a special occasion for Emmanuel Church. We're, Amen? We're, we're also going to be rededicating the new officers that are coming into position as well because we want our church to move forward in a, in a united front and we want to do everything we possibly can to make this year the best year that Emmanuel Church has ever had because God will be with us we're going to rededicate this sanctuary. We're going to be dedicating the new officers that God will pour out his wisdom upon us and that we will be so filled with the spirit, so evident that God is with us, that others will see us and they'll say, I want to be part of that. I want to join that type of movement that God will lead us right into the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So brethren, let us pray for that day and pray to the hand and pray for God's people everywhere. At this time, we are going to reverently kneel as we seek the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, this morning we thy children gather into your house to lift up praise to your high and holy name. We thank you, Lord, for life that you have extended to us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that you have given to us to teach us, to guide us, and to keep us in the straight and narrow way. As we come into your course today, Lord, we ask your forgiveness of our sins and to cleanse us now, Lord, from all unrighteousness. Help us to come with a hope and heart to receive the dropping of your words today. Open our minds, Lord. Give us the wisdom and the understanding we need. And help us, Lord, that as we study your word, we will be drawn closer to you. We pray, Lord, for the Holy Spirit to pour it out upon your people 
But first of all, we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, we ask you to come divinely near us now and cleanse us, Lord, so that you can baptize us anew. We can feel the refreshing of your Holy Spirit upon us as your people today as we draw nearer to you. Remember those who are sick among us, Lord, we pray them up. We put them before the throne of grace. We ask you, dear Lord, to reach down from your throne room and touch in a very special way, Lord, not only the physical body, but the mind and the soul. Help us, dear Lord, that we will humble our hearts to you as we seek your divine help. Lord, we pray for those this morning who are weeping and mourning the loss of loved ones. Father, we pray for strength. We pray for courage. We pray, Lord, that you will give them that comfort of heart as they mourn the loss of their loved ones. We pray for your people, Lord, as we worship you today. We pray that we will see the nearness of your coming and we'll be drawn closer to you. Lord, we must confess we have sinned. We have strayed from thy precepts and thy example, Lord. We have not walking as we ought to walk. Lord, we pray this morning for your Holy Spirit direction that we may give up selfishness, we may give up pride, the things that so easily beset us and will be drawn closer to you. We pray for a revival among your people. We pray for a reformation, Lord. We pray that we will take heed to our ways and acknowledge that thy coming is near. Now, Lord, we present the one who will break the bread of life. We place her before you this morning. She's your unmade, Lord, and she's doing your work. Help us, Lord, that as we place her before thee, the Holy Spirit will come down today. And, Lord, you, she will hear the voice speaking to her as she speaks to your people. And Lord, we will open ears, we will open our hearts, and as we receive your words, Lord, we will go and live them and help others to come to know you as Lord and Savior. We pray, Lord, for the congregation, this waiting congregation. May our hearts be lifted up with joy and happiness, that when we leave this door today, Lord, the message we hear will burn within our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for the blessing that you have bestowed upon your people. We pray in Jesus' name. morning church as we're celebrating um, Father's Day weekend <laughs> this song is just to remind you that we have to trust our Heavenly Father no matter what situation we're in Pathway seems dim and 
So much, Janique. She always adds something special to church, wherever she goes. Thank you so much. This morning, I'm going to introduce you to somebody that I feel like I've known them for a long time. Although this is the first time I've met them personally. I've been watching him on YouTube. I've been watching him on, on, on the internet. And, and i got to tell you, folks, this man is part of a team, a family team, that loves the Lord with all of their heart. I hope you don't mind me saying this, but he, he describes himself as a recovering mortgage broker. <laughs> I believe I'm saying that right. He gave that up in order to serve God, <clears throat> to help people in the, and take his experiences and his expertise and his knowledge in the field of finances and to help God's people. And recently, his wife, Carmen, joined the team. Turn that light. Would you rather me call you Emmanuel? No. 
We want to thank, she joined the team and together they're going to, to share with us today and then this evening as well. And you'll want to make sure you're here this evening because you're going to get an even bigger blessing that's going to be in a practical way. Uh, Jason Thomas, thank you so much for being with us today and your wife as well, Carmen. Good morning, everyone. We are Future Family Finance, and as you can see, we have a family here. I've got the privilege today of int introducing my wife, and if I have to use notes, you know that's a problem, right? <laughs> but we have been doing financial seminars around the country now for a number of years, and it has been our experience, especially within our church, that we have one of the greatest wealth building manuals that we don't use. It's called Councils on Stewardship. And what we are here today, this afternoon actually, is to share with you the power of it. Now the biggest problem that most of us have when we come to church, we, church has become for us a pill that we take to take us from the reality of the mundaneness of life. The bills, the debts, the creditors, we know some of those. It's the only time when we can come and put our phone on silent for at least 24 hours, am I correct? And we're so grateful many times, not for the Sabbath because of the day, but because it takes us away from the realities that we live in. And that's the problem. And what we're going to be able to do this afternoon is help rectify that problem. You see, it is our belief that as a family, that if we are directly connected to the source of all wealth, then why don't we have it? And that's a big issue within, the, within our churches. So what you are going to experience today as a family unit, showing that as a husband and wife team, how this can actually be done. My wife and I got married in 2006, and I must say today that she is the best partner that I've had. And I must also admit, it really wasn't until I recently, even though I've been doing this now for how many years now? Four years. About six months ago, she decided to partner up with me and we worked together. What we've done in the last six months, four months, is more than what I've been able to accomplish in the last five years. That's true. Okay? So you'll bear witness to the power of that. I know that about You know that about <laughs> And so this afternoon, Carmen is going to be doing our sermon today. She has a powerful message that you need to listen to. And just as powerful of what, we, what, is she, what she's here to do today is the message that we also have this afternoon when it comes to eliminating financial debt. For some of us, there's been a disconnect with God and debt, and that the two don't synchronize together, but there's a direct connection. All of our churches should be debt free. Every home should be paid off at an average of eight to 12 years. And imagine if everyone sitting in this audience was totally debt free. We wouldn't have to spend hours upon hours in board meetings trying to figure out how we're gonna deal with the debt that we have here and how we're gonna take our message throughout the community. So that's what we're going to be tackling this afternoon. But first, I want you to bear witness to the ministry this afternoon of what she has to share with you. I can tell that many of you have a lot on your mind. I can see it. I can tell that many of you are here, but you're not here. I 
can tell that you were probably here last week and the week before that and the week before that and you're sitting here the same way you were last week and the week before that and the week before that and that's okay it's okay because I have come today just to share with you what God has given me to you and it's interesting because I truly believe that my message just from sitting in Sabbath school is specifically for this church and I'm, I'm going to tell you this I was not supposed to speak today I was not my husband usually does this part, but I decided that there was something that was kind of nagging on me that I wanted to share with you. And I want to thank your pastor, Pastor Ferris, for this opportunity. And I want to thank my husband because a lot of men don't always feel comfortable having their wives kind of step out from behind them. You understand what I mean? A lot of men don't take to that too well. But my husband is not typical, and I thank God for that. Our ministry, Future Family Finance, came to me back in October of last year. And do you want me to use another mic? Or this mic is going this is good. This one? Okay. Testing. Oh yeah, that's better. This ministry came to me last year. This was worse. Okay. <laughs> I was uh, with my husband in Bermuda, he was there doing financial seminars. And I'm con my husband, I'm going to wait. Testing one. That's better. Okay. I was with my husband last year in October. He was doing financial seminars in Bermuda. And it was the very first time in about three years that I got an opportunity to see him do what he does. And the reason why I hadn't been seeing him do what he does, because we have kids. Normally I was outside in the back with the, with the boys or with my first son, and then I got pregnant with my second son, and so I was never with him to see what he did. I knew what he was doing, but I, I just didn't get a chance to sit down and listen because of the kids. But once I saw what he did, my background is in marketing and advertising, and I did that for several years before I got married. I said to him, honey, we can do this together. Now, he's had many partners, many. They've argued about the direction of the company and what they wanted to do. But I felt, as his wife, we could do this, and we could do it together. And we can make it more of a family thing because what he was teaching, most times he was teaching directly to other men about how to help lead the family out of debt. But I kept telling him, you know, women need to be a part of this because most women kind of handle most of what's going on. So what we're going to share with you is our personal mantra, which is we help families pass wealth, not debt, to the next generation. How many of you received a house when your parent died that was debt free and didn't have a mortgage on it? Not many of us. I know when my mom died in 2008, she had just refinanced her house.
today we want to help you understand just how money works. How many of us can say that? Knowing just how the bank is making their money from you. We don't understand money. And on our jobs, what's interesting is we don't make enough money to pay everything, but we make just a little too much to quit. You know, we look at our what we have and we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I know it's not much, but I don't want to let that go either. And we came here on our own. We normally, which is interesting, we get more calls from first day churches than Adventist churches. And I'm a fifth generation Adventist. I think my husband is sixth generation. We walk right into a first day church with a councils on stewardship and we share and they eat it up. But we have, I bet if I polled this church and I went to your homes, I'm sure there are at least six to eight copies of that book in your houses right now. And the reason why I say that we come here every week and I can look at you and tell you do, we've gotten numb to what we have. And we have to be very careful because this is what God t told us would happen in these days. We're just going to be lulled into the conundrum of the weekly ritual of coming to Sabbath service. We have to be careful not to be caught up into that. There's a time of trouble, and there used to be a time when you could go into any church and you would hear, there's a time of trouble coming. There's a cashless society. Money will be thrown into the streets. No one will pick it up. Remember those sermons? You don't hear them too much anymore. We'll run to the hills. Churches will be boarded up. Churches will be boarded up with their million dollar mortgages on them. They sure will be boarded up. Sometimes I'm confused as to how we plan to do this thing because none of us are talking about it. Where's the battle cry? Who's screaming the message of our God? Who is doing it? When most of you are looking at me as though you've got something else going on at the house that you got to get back to. We have to be careful. We must be careful. We know we are living in the end times. We know that time is short. We know it's short. We say it, but do we believe it? Turn in your Bibles with me to Ruth, chapter 1. And I'm going to ask you to do a little something for me. I want you to stand as I read the word of God in reverence to the word. And all I want you to do is look at it in your Bible. I'm going to read from the NIV in your hearing. When you get Ruth chapter 1, I want you to stand to your feet to show that you've received it. Ruth chapter 1. And you don't have to say amen. I'm not one of these people who say, say amen. You don't have to say a word. I want you to listen to what God has to say. You don't have to shout. You don't have to do a thing, but just listen. Ruth 
The Bible says in Ruth chapter 1, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and the sons, Malone and Kilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malone and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people, by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back, each of you to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to the dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? Who would become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I still, I am too old to have another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth, Ruth, Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. With where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will become my people. And your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so bitterly, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. And they arrived in Bethlehem the whole town was stirred because of them. Now to verse 22. So Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as barley harvest was beginning. Today I want to speak to you from the topic how culture can hinder your freedom. How culture can hinder your freedom. Let us pray. 
O Yahweh, creator of all things, giver of all things, give us your spirit today. Open our hearts and our minds and our ears and help us to hear you. Only you. We thank you in the precious and most worthy name of your son, the Messiah. We pray. Amen. You may be seated. I love family trees. I love it. I love it so much that anybody in here could come to me and say, you know, I've been trying to find out more about my father's family. Would you help me? And I would say, yes, just give me what you know, and I'll do all the research. That's just how much I love researching family trees. I have two accounts on Ancestry.com. I even have another account on a Caribbean website and Ancestry.com that's in the UK. I've got a I've got an account there too because I just love family trees. I really do. My mom, her family is from southern Georgia, but her mother was born in the west panhandle of Florida. My grandmother's mother and father, born most likely into slavery, were born in the Carolinas. And I kind of have gotten a bit stuck because I can't go beyond them because of the whole slavery thing. But what's interesting is my husband's family, his father's from Jamaica and his mother is from Aruba. And what's interesting is, is if you ask my husband right now, I probably know more about his family tree than he does because I sit up all night on the computer and I research, it's fun to me. I have even been to Spanish Town in Jamaica to the Hall of Records, and I sat there all day one day going through trying to find his great-great-great-grandfather's death certificate that's there uh, in, in the Hall of Records. That's just how much I love. We were on vacation, and I, they dropped me off. I was like, I'm good. Y'all go to the beach. I'm Go to Hillshire. I'm going to be in the Hall of Records because I really wanted to have this information. My, paternal, my husband's paternal great-grandmother was born in Manchester, Jamaica, and she was born in a little area called Coleyville. How many? Coleyville? Yes, there's some folks here that know Coleyville. You know what's interesting? I found her father's baptismal record circa 1832. It was huge. My father-in-law went crazy when he saw it. Because I found it. My, my husband, I mean, he, he's excited when I find these things, but even more so excited are the ones that say, how did you find this? My father-in-law said, where did you get this? Are you sure? I even found the birth certificate of um, my husband's uncle, the actual birth certificate, with my husband's grandfather's signature on it saying that he was present at the birth of his brother. All of this stuff is just so exciting to me. I love it. Last year, I took on my dad's family. Now, they're from Florida. My dad's dad, uh, and well, my dad's great-grandfather was named Jacob C. Hope. I'm telling you all of this for a reason, so just bear with me. Jacob C. Hope was a sharecropper in the Ocala Bellevue area here in Florida. And what's interesting about Jacob is that he married a woman named Alice Muntz. And Alice died in childbirth, which of course was common. And he took up with her sister, Sarah, and they had more kids. Just kids. And that happened a lot. A lot of times when, you know, one person died, a sibling or whoever came along and they just kept going. And what's interesting is, is the two sets of children don't consider themselves related, which is odd to me, but they don't. They consider themselves two separate sets of hopes, but we're all related. Now, I'm telling you all this because I need you to understand the power of family, the power of culture, and the power of your beginnings, whatever those beginnings are. 
our beginning and those that have come before us really speak to how we see people and their struggles. Even looking at this tragedy that just happened in South Carolina at that church, it's unconceivable, unconscionable that this young man who killed nine innocent people actually believed what he believed. His thought, his belief, his culture goes all the way back to the Confederacy. And that's how deep-seated it is. So you have to say, we have to do a better job, especially now, of looking at culture. What you believe about yourself, what you've been taught about who you are and what you are. I can still tell that you guys don't believe me. We get excited about our culture. Let me ask you this. How many folks in here from the Virgin Islands? Anybody? Okay, got a Virgin Islander there. See you by yourself. If there was another one, you two will be high-fiving and hoop-hooping. What about Jamaica? I think I heard Jamaica. So, okay, see, Jamaica's in the house. And see, she did like this. And then she did, yeah, see, I see you. Anybody from TNT, Trinidad and Tobago? Okay, okay, see, see, see. What about the Bahamas? Got to be one or two from the Bahamas. No? No Bahamas? But see, what's interesting for me is being married to a man of West Indian descent, I find your cultures a little funny, if you don't mind me saying. And it's funny in a good way. And let me explain to you why. Can I talk about y'all for a minute? Every once in a while, we'll go to a potluck and nobody, nobody eats red meat until some curry goat hits the table. I've got folks in my husband's family who swear they are vegan until some Escovish fish hits the table. I laugh about it, but my own personal story of marriage and family finally brought home the story of Ruth for me. I draw inspiration for it for you today, and I want to share with you. Culturally, we see African Americans born here in the U.S. and West Indian Americans, we see those cultures differently. We say we're different. Well, I'm going to show you something. Because if we look a little closer, we'll realize that we're all a bit more the same than you think we are. Sure, remember, the main difference between us really is no difference at all. The slave ships actually split up families on board purposely. Some they dropped off in South America, some in the Caribbean, and lastly in the Carolinas, breaking up families along the way. And they did that on purpose. So now, when we intermarry, we consider ourselves culturally different. But you must consider the story in Ruth for just a moment, back in that day, there was a famine in the land. There was no work, there was no food, and Elimelech, his wife Naomi, and their two sons, Malone and Kilion, immigrated to the United States from Jamaica. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, from Bethlehem to Moab. Elimelech died. And the sons married American women, I mean Moabite women. Ruth married Malone, and Kilion married Orpah. After about 10 years, the two sons of Naomi died as well, and Naomi decided to return back home to Kingston, I mean Bethlehem. Ruth said to her, entreat me not to leave you, even though Oprah was gone. She said, I will go where you go. I will eat ackee and saltfish just like you're going to eat it. I'm going to live where you live. I will die where you die. 
Now, everyone focuses on this story because of Boaz. Everyone wants to get to the Boaz part. But you know what? I, I, I don't want to go there just yet. I'm just kind of stuck in the story of Ruth and Naomi. I, like everybody, loves a good love story. Ruth gets her man, and we know she gets her man, but let's talk about how she gets that man. Now, let me say for the record, I have a wonderful appreciation for my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law is a good woman. As a matter of fact, I wore this dress on purpose because she gave it to me. So the spirit of my mother-in-law is with me today. God forbid, though, if my mother-in-law and I were both widowed, she lives around the corner from me, by the way, in Huntsville, if we both lost our husbands, I just can't see myself moving with her to St. Vincent. I just don't see it. <laughs> I'm not going to St. Vincent. I just, I don't see that happening. But if we think about it, that's exactly what Ruth did. I mean, think about it. Ruth was home. She knew everybody around her. She was around her family. But she left her family and went home with her mother-in-law to a country where she knew nobody but her mother-in-law to a place where the customs, sure, I'm sure she was familiar with the customs. I'm sure she was a familiar with the food. I'm certain she ate kosher foods and she didn't eat pork and she did all of that. I'm sure she did that because of the sake of her husbands. But she decided to move with her mother-in-law. An even more interesting dynamic is this relationship with a mother-in-law. I just think about it sometimes. You know, a lot of people, he's excited. I know a lot of people who talk about mother-in-laws. Mother-in-laws are not very much seen in a good light here in this country. I went online and I found about a million jokes. <laughs> with the mother-in-law is the punchline. Mother-in-laws get a bad rap. They are pushy, they're nosy. Most people consider their mother-in-law number one on the list of folks they could live without. But Ruth, <laughs> Ruth, who was in her hometown living amongst her folks, opted to leave the comfort of her culture the people she knew, the folks she knew, the food she knew, to go and live with her mother-in-law. Now you see, Moabites were not looked upon favorably with the Israelites. You do remember where the Moabites came from, how they came about. Let me refresh your memory. Moab was the son of Lot and one of his daughters. The story goes this way. When the angel of the Lord came and fire and brimstone fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot, his unnamed wife, and his two unnamed virgin daughters were warned. They fled the city. Lot, wife, turns back, turns into a pillow of salt. The two daughters and Lot go on to a nearby city. They dwelled there for a while, but then Lot got scared and ran into the mountains, which is where the angel told him to go in the first place. And they dwelled there, according to the Bible, many years. Some scholars say that the daughters thought that they were the only people on the earth. They assumed that God had destroyed everybody. So, at some point, the older sister comes up with a cockamamie plan. She wants to get daddy drunk. She gets her father drunk, goes in and sleeps with him, gets pregnant. He doesn't know when she comes in or when she goes out. Then the second daughter decides, well, I'm going to try that too. They get their father drunk. She goes in. She has sex with her father, gets pregnant, and both of them have two sons, Ammon and Moab. 
Ruth is a descendant of Moab. Just to get some understanding as to why the Israelis didn't care too much for Moabites, we have to look at Moab, his beginnings, and what they believed. Moab and Moabites worshipped a god named Kamush. Kamush means destroyer, subduer, the fish god. Now, while most people associate Moab with Kamush, the Ammonites, their cousins, they worshipped Kamush as well, which could easily be some cooked up derivative of something from Sodom and Gomorrah because that's where they came out of. Now, the Hebrews had some issues with Kamush because King Solomon, in all of his marrying around him to try to keep peace, married a woman from Moab, and they had erected a statue of Kamush in Jerusalem. So there was a sect of Hebrew, -lite, Hebrew, Hebrew Israelites who also worshipped Kamush. Kamush did some human sacrificing. They didn't just sacrifice lambs. They had to sacrifice humans. And some scholars believed that they sacrificed children. Children. Babies. One other scholar said they usually chose girls to sacrifice. Pretty, blemishless little girls on the altar before a stone god. I, I, just the thought of that makes my stomach just curdle. So now that we have some context, I can see why Naomi said, no, you need to stay here. You can't come back with me. They're not going to treat you kindly. You're a Moabite. And then you ask yourself, you know, oftentimes, especially when we look at the cultural differences, I know, let, let me just be honest, I'm sure my in-laws would have preferred my husband marrying another girl from Jamaica. Would have made sense to them. But of course, over time, we had to work on that. <laughs> but it's the truth. Sometimes you want something that's comfortable. I know where she's from, and I know what they believe. And I, that's why you want your sons and daughters to go out and get other Adventists, because it's easier. Nobody has to convince them of anything. But what's interesting about this story that I think a lot of people miss is that Ruth, had to have heard something, had to have felt something for this family to want to stay in it, even though her connection to it had died. She had heard a sermon or, a, or read a text in study or something happened where she said, no, 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 no. I want to be there with them. Where they go, I'm going. I want to die where they die. Because Ruth, with all of her cultural hang-ups that you and I saw and still see, was kind, she was loving, she had to be a seeker of righteousness, she had to be. And I believe, this is just my personal piece here, that there are some really good things we can learn from Ruth and her story. God is always looking for those who are willing to walk away from what is comfortable. If we thought about what we were doing before we came to know this message in this place, some of us don't want each other to know what we came out of. If you really got transparent and told some truth about what you came out of, 
some of us would look at each other a little differently. Ruth, just like Moses, followed God into complete unknown. She had no idea what she was going into, but she could have easily gone around the corner from her house where she was living with Naomi and been very comfortable, but she didn't do that. Many of you left your home islands to come to, un you didn't know what to expect. Some of you had a family member or uncle or somebody who had come before, but think about it, Ruth had nobody, not a soul. And it wasn't like Naomi was a spring chicken. She knew she was going to die at some point. Then she would have really been alone. She put all of that aside to follow her heart in God. We miss out on so many blessings because we don't want to go to the unfamiliar. We don't want to try anything new. Many of us in these churches that we call Seventh-day Adventists are the first to pick up a rock to stone the pastor when he has a new idea that he wants to implement that didn't come direct from the conference office. Some of us are confused when we pitch a tent in a neighborhood and we preach that same evangelism series that brought us into the church 50 years ago with the same tent, the same slides of the Jesus coming out of heaven with all the angels around him, the same porta potties, the same heat, the same dirt, and we're confused and puzzled when we don't baptize that many folk anymore. We blame it on the devil. We blame it on the spirit not falling. We, we need to do this. We need to do that. But we don't realize that we got this thing wrong. Now, don't, don't misunderstand me. The message needn't change. We need to consider our method because we steadily are trying to use an eight-track message in a DVD, Blu-ray, Netflix, Hulu, Apple TV, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, society. The second point I want to bring up to you is this. Culture oftentimes keeps us from being free. My dad's family used to eat any and everything imaginable. Pork, squirrels, possums, turtles, you name it, they ate it. For years, we used to tell them about the health message, but they refused to hear it. Now my 67-year-old my uncle is the only one left. Everyone else is dead from heart disease, diabetes, strokes, you name it. His culture, his culture, he believed, was okay. My 67-year-old uncle, he goes to dialysis every other day for four hours. He's been doing this now for the past four years. He's had a stroke, a mild heart attack, but every other day, like clockwork, he has to go and take his dialysis. His culture, that same culture that he believed was okay, has him with one foot in the grave and one foot out. His mantra, my daddy ate it, my mama ate it, it was good for them, it's good for me. But now his doctor has finally come to him and made him understand and confirmed for me that Ellen White, Ellen White and her counsels on eating and counsel on foods, that he has now finally given up some of those things that he's been eating. But it took his doctor to convince him to make some changes. Which leads me to my point. Even 
if our culture is killing us, many of us are willing to die. Like lambs led to the slaughter. That's how we live when we're in debt. We live in a culture today of debt. The country's in debt. The church is in debt. You are in debt. Everybody is in debt. And if everybody's in debt, it must be all right because we continue to perpetuate it and we even teach our children about debt. You know, I, I'm going to pause for a second because it's funny. I, my husband and I are convinced that we have got to teach our children that they do not have to be in debt. And it's a hard lesson to teach because they see their friends. They see all of their friends with all of these things, things that nobody needed when we were children or even our parents were children, but because they're there, they want them. And every time we plan to go anywhere or do anything, I make my son pitch his little tent with his little table I make him some lemonade and he sits out in front of our house and he sells that lemonade because he knows that if he's going to have any money when he goes anywhere, he's going to have to make it himself. And I've had a few people say to me that I'm a little hard on him because he's only six, but I'm telling them, no, 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 you do you. And I got this. This is because when Jesus asks me where they are, I'm going to say right here. (laughs) That's my plan. And so he sits out there and he'll make six dollars and spend all six in one (laughs) and he's finally catching on because I took him to the store when we first got here in Orlando with his money in a bag and he bought some goggles because he wanted to use them when he went swimming well the goggles of course broke and he was swimming at the hotel and the goggles were in the pool he was looking for his goggles looking for the goggles because they had come off when he slid down the slide into the pool. But, but the goggles are his. He bought them with his money that he earned. And a lot of times, we don't allow our kids to get that feeling of pride when you earn something yourself and you spend it yourself. We, we don't give our kids that opportunity. And we need to do that because children, especially now, especially now. Do you know they say that almost 80% of every child, when they come of age and they leave their parents' home, they're in more debt than their parents were at that age. So what's happening is is we are just passing debt along, and before long, our children are going to be in so much debt that they can't do anything. Right now, they say the average young person in California has got to live with their parents even after marriage because they can't afford to buy a house. That's a problem. And none of us are addressing it. We say, well, the cost of things are going up and things are going up. No, we are living more and more in debt, and we're comfortable and okay with it. That's the problem. We've just gotten comfortable. The last thing I want to make sure you understand is this. No matter who you are, no matter where you come from, God has something amazing for you to do. Don't let your culture keep you from hearing God. Ruth came from an idol-worshiping culture, yet she became the great-great-grandmother of David. Hence, she is in Christ himself, his family tree. We write people off when we find out where they're from. We write people off when we hear about their customs of their family and their culture. We do that all the time. (laughs) I remember some years ago I belonged to a church, just to give you an example. The first elder was from the Caribbean. 
He had all girls. And finally, his wife had a son. And because everybody in this church loved this elder, we loved him. He was just a pillar of our church. So the son was doted upon by everyone. He grew up. His sisters grew up in church school, of course. They went off to college, of course. And when the son came of age and started dating, everyone was shocked beyond measure when he brought home a woman 10 years his senior with two children from a divorced relationship. She was not Adventist, completely blinged out, and everyone had a problem with this woman. They treated her bad. Folks didn't talk to her when she came to church. And in spite of all of that, she got baptized. Her kids got baptized. They got married. And now they've been married for 13 years. They have a child together, and he's adopted her children. And I promise you, if you had this couple at your house for Sabbath dinner, you'd swear she was fifth generation Adventist and he just came in. That's how much she embraced what she had heard. Culturally, on paper, she didn't fit. She was not supposed to be there. It was not supposed to be her. Culturally. But God doesn't care about your culture. God doesn't care about your mama and your dad and what they came from and how many generations of Adventism you are in. God is looking for people who are willing to leave all of that behind and follow him. God is looking for people who are willing to just drop it and say, you know what? I need a fresh anointing daily. I can't live on the old stale anointing of my mom and dad. Because what worked for them is not working right now for us. That's why many of you are looking at me as though your mind is someplace else. Because you're working on an old anointing. We have to ask for God to give us something fresh and new daily. That's why study is so important. That's why prayer is so important. You can't just pray on Sabbath morning. By the time the arsenal of the enemy is so built up against you, you can't get a word out. We have to do a better job of understanding that culturally, I don't care how many Degrees you have, I don't care that you were the elder at your church back in in wherever you're from. It doesn't matter because God is looking for folk who are willing to follow him and not their old pastor. We have got to do a better job because that's one of the reasons why our churches, though we erect them, we can throw up a church now. We will have a tent meeting throw up a church, and in six months, we can't find half of the people we baptized. We have to do a better job. It's something we've got to take responsibility for. It's our responsibility. God is pouring out his spirit. Are you catching it? Are you catching it? Do you seek him every day? Do you put your bills and your problems and everything on the altar that's erected in your house daily? Just like that children's story that I thought was beautifully done. God is trying to bless us, but we're so into the mundane of it all that we can't hear him. He's constantly doing just like this. 
But you got so much stuff going in your own in your home, you don't know that there's anybody at the door. You have no idea that there's anybody at the door. You got the TV on and the bill collectors are calling and everything, your kids are driving you crazy. Some of us don't know where our kids are. So if God was talking to you, would you even hear him? Would we? Be honest with yourself. Because in church is the only place you can be honest. It should be. We've got to do a better job. Because the time is gone. It's not winding up. It's finished. We've got to be in the ceiling phase. We have to be. Because people are walking into churches and opening fire on the people while they study in the word. Are you kidding me? This has got to be it. You don't have any time to get it together. We have to decide right now we're going to do this thing. There's no time to go home and pray about it or think about it. I'm going to pray with the family and we'll do we'll. No, you may not make it out this door. I'm sure on Wednesday night those folks had no clue that boy was going to get up and open fire. He sat there for an hour praying and studying with them. I'm sure they just knew there was a lost soul that had just walked into the door. Who knew he had that agenda? No one but the enemy himself. And yet we can sit here in church stone-faced, no emotion, no nothing. Like I said, you don't have to say amen when I'm up here. You don't have to say a word. I want you to listen. Sometimes when I sing in places, I am just engulfed and I want to run. And, and people are looking at me just like, you know what? You don't have to say, oh, I can worship by myself. I don't need anybody to help me worship. Not a soul. You don't have to say a thing. Don't clap your hand and don't wave it. You sit there and you listen for the word from God himself. Because that's what's missing in us. We don't hear him. You can't possibly hear him. If you heard him, you would not be stone-faced looking at me right now. If you heard him. If we knew the blessings that God had for us. Many of us are so close-minded to anything that we don't understand. No, 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 no. The devil is busy. We don't need to, no, we don't need to listen to them. Did they come from the conference office? Did the president sanction it? When the Lord himself is trying to tell you something, you're looking to men to get confirmation. Are you kidding me? We have to have our own relationship because the president of the conference may not answer his phone when you call. He could be busy. And we have to call and have our own relationship because I promise you this. When God speaks to a church, he will speak to the one or two people that need to be talked to. And if two or three people say, I heard something, it's so interesting. Last, last week I heard a sermon. The pastor was sitting in a board meeting on a Sunday afternoon. It was freezing outside. Snow had just covered. This was up in Ohio. And while they were sitting there, the elder, not even the first elder, but one of the elders said, Pastor, Pastor, I just feel like we need to go next door. And the pastor said, what are you talking about? He says, the spirit is just on, on me heavy. I, I, I think we need to go next door. And the pastor said, listen, I'm the pastor of this church. And if the spirit is talking to you, he's going to talk to me. He says, I don't know, Pastor. I really think we should go next door. So the pastor, the elder, and one other elder got up, put their coats on, and they went outside. And sure enough, the door to the house next to the church was open. Now, it's freezing outside. He said it had to be at least two or three degrees. 
So they, open, they stood up, walked up to the step and opened the door, and there were nine people huddled around a space heater, freezing. Nobody had on a coat. They just were sharing a, pieces of blanket. But they had to open the door because of the fumes from the kerosene heater. They needed to get some relief and some fresh air. So the pastor went in and said, are you? All these years he had been pastoring this church and never knew this family was there. Freezing. They got all of the people out of the, the house, turned the kerosene heater off, and took them into the church to get them warm. Right then, the 19-year-old boy that was the young man that was there said to the pastor, I want to be baptized. They filled the pool up, baptized the boy. They didn't wait for church. The next Sabbath, they baptized him right then. From his baptism, they baptized the entire family, and the whole family now comes to church every Sabbath. The house that they were in next door was not up to code. There was no way they could live there. So they had a community service house on the other side of the church, just full of old clothes, boxes, and food. They said, you help us get all this stuff out of here. You can get what you want, but you can live here. So the family went from this side of the church across to the other side of the church and cleaned out the house. The house is beautiful. And they live in that house. And it's all because the pastor had to humble himself because the spirit was probably talking to him. And listen, it's the, the spirit was like, yo, if you're not going to let me get to the, no, the first elder's not going to hear me. Oh, the next elder, he's not going to hear. They went to the junior elder. The spirit went to the junior elder sitting there. And the junior elder said, I think we got to get up. I got to move. That's why our culture is so dangerous sometimes. What we think should be is not always what it's going to be. And we have to be open to something new. Because if we're not open to something new, think about it. It was my uncle who became an Adventist first. At 16 years old, he heard H.L. Cleveland do a 10 effort in Ocala, Florida. He ran home and told his mom and dad, you got to come hear this man. They brushed him off a couple of times. No, we're not. Saturday, we're not going to pork. We got a ham in the refrigerator right now. We're eating that ham. But finally, my grandfather went with my uncle to this tent meeting, came home and threw everything out of the refrigerator that was not clean. The whole family got baptized. And if not for that, if not for that, my uncle wouldn't have been the president of Southeastern Conference. My aunt wouldn't be in the North American division. Because somebody, the spirit said, probably said, you know what? He's not going to receive it. Oh, no, she's not going to receive it. Let's go to the son. He'll get it. And instead of us turning away things that are, un, that are foreign to us, we need to say, well, wait a minute, Lord. Are you trying to tell me something? Maybe it's me. I got to be open to something else, something new. And that's why we're here. About three years ago, and I'm closing now, I was the finance chair at our church down in Miami. We had a problem a big problem. Our pastor was buying up property all around us, but none of it was connected. It was always the, not this lot, but the next lot. Not the one directly behind us, but the one to the corner behind us. We had acquired all these little pieces of property. And all of them had debt tied to them. We wanted to build a daycare of some kind because the church was so young. All of us were young professionals. You know, we were just getting married. You know, we knew that we would have children to put in a daycare because we were all in our mid-30s. So it made sense. 
So we got to fiddling around and trying to figure out, okay, well, we got to get rid of this mortgage or else we got to get rid of that mortgage too because we had pieces of mortgages on all of these properties. We heard about this program, this program. This Adventist guy had come up with this educational program about money. Oh, in the finance meeting, I remember somebody said, oh, here comes somebody with, no, no, we probably need to call the conference and get this guy checked out. They, he could probably, we, we don't know, well, what does he want? Are you, no, 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 we, and we, we argued a little bit because anytime you're dealing with money, we get scared. Uh-oh, here comes somebody coming to take our money. Is it sanctioned by the conference? We probably need to call the stewardship director and check with them and see if they could check it out. All of that went on for a long time, and then finally the pastor put his foot down and said, you know what, I don't need to call anybody. Let's hear what the guy has to say. So sure enough, we brought the guy in, and he gave us a presentation on money that nobody in there had ever seen ever before. Why didn't we know this? My husband was baffled. He'd been a mortgage broker. He'd worked in banking for years. He had a finance degree. He said, I've never seen this before, ever. So then they, we were all scared. Wait a minute, how could you not have seen this before? You work in, and then he started to think about it and he said, well, wait a minute. Because some of these principles, this is what the bank uses to take your money. Okay, so finally somebody's come up with a way to take that information and help you save your money. Okay, I get it. So sure enough, the church adopted the program. We had nine years left on all of our mortgages. The pastor was kind of scared. If this don't work, I'm gonna look crazy. We paid off everything in about five to eight months. And we didn't raise the bucket. We didn't pass the bucket around extra. Nobody had to sacrifice. We used the same giving that was already taking place. We just understood now how to look at our money differently. It was cutting edge. Nobody was doing it. No Adventist church was doing it. First day churches had picked, few of them had picked up on it and they were doing it, but not Adventist. There was no, and all the guy used to come up with the program was councils on stewardship. Now he's using councils on stewardship, but the Adventists didn't want to touch it, which made no sense to me. But isn't that how God said it would be? Didn't he say the first will be last and the last will be first? And for those of us who don't want to accept his word, he's just going to give it to the Gentiles? Heaven's going to be filled with somebody. It may not be you. And you have to understand that that's how this thing is going to go down. Somebody's going to have stars in their crown. You're not just going up and trip into heaven. It doesn't work that way. You have to purpose to go, and you have to purpose that somebody's going with you. And that is what our issues have boiled down to. Culturally, if it's uncomfortable and it's new, we don't want to touch it. And we have to do better. Because otherwise, Jesus cannot come. He can't. We have to do better. We have to be open. And if you want to be open, I need you to stand to your feet. If you want to be open to something new that the Spirit wants to tell you, you got to get up. There may be somebody here today who doesn't even know God at all. You just came on the invitation. There may be somebody here who thought they knew him, 
but realize that they've just been going through the motions every day. I could tell you this. Ruth's story is my story. Ruth's story is my personal story. I make fried dumpling better than my mother-in-law. <laughs> and I make some mean ackee and saltfish. Because I walked away from my culture didn't mean I walked away from myself. It's just that my God gave my husband a vision and I was the only woman willing to go with him. So to make him comfortable, I make him happy. So that he could do what God has called him to do. Now, sure, there was a cute little girl. I remember when I was dating him, it was another girl. It's all right. I could talk about her now. It's been eight years. And she, oh, she could make it all. She knew it all. She had her patois down perfectly. Her mother and her father knew my in-law. Everybody was friends. But she would not be standing here right now. No way. This idea, what my husband is doing, would have been too beneath her. You need to go back to finance. You need to get a job at a bank. You need to be the CEO of a bank or you need to be the president or of a branch or something. That was her thing. But see, we're so, we get lost in our own agendas sometimes. Culturally speaking, we want things to look a certain way for the family to look a certain, but God is trying to just save you by any means necessary. And if you want to be saved by any means necessary, you've got to be open to something new. Are you ready for something new? Are you ready for a fresh anointing from God? Something different. Something that can hold you until he comes. I can tell you this. You can't get it every week. You got to get it every day. That every week, that doesn't work anymore. Not when people are walking into churches and opening fire. That does not work. A woman stood at the memorial on yesterday, trembling in her voice. She was supposed to be at that Bible study on Wednesday night, but her air conditioner repairman called and said something was not working and that she needed to come home. So she left the church early. And when she left the church early, she went home, and within 20 minutes, the young man had opened fire. She trembled standing at the podium trying to read a Bible text. And what I'm saying to you is, does something life-altering like that need to happen to you to get you to understand that you are missing an opportunity to meet the Savior on a personal encounter? Do you have to lose a child or a parent or something tragic have to happen to you for you to have that personal experience? Does that have to happen? Ask yourself. Because God is trying to do something new for you like he did for Ruth. Ruth, through her obedience, became the great-great-grandmother of David the king. She was not supposed to be there. I'm sure Boaz could have married any Israelite girl. 
She had been, she was a widow. He had never been married before. You're not telling me that there were people who said she should not be here. The Bible is explicit that the Israelites didn't treat her kindly at all. But she was willing to do something new. Let us pray. Oh, Yahweh, we thank you. We praise you. And we look for a fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit right now. We ask that you bind the enemy. You said in your word that if we bind it on earth, it's bound in heaven. And so, Lord, we bind him now. We are open to your leading. We're open to your word and your counsel. Help us to shake off all that old stuff we brought from our old countries. Give us a fresh anointing of your spirit a new counsel, a new direction. Give it to us now, we pray, oh God. Everyone in this community should say, what is going on at that church? What are they doing? I want that. I want it for me. Those people are free, and I want to be free too. Because our culture and what we're used to, oh God, is hindering our freedom. Sabbath service should be filled, filled with hallelujah and shouting and praises to your name because we know you and we've experienced an encounter with you. Instead, Lord, we're bogged down with bills and problems and our prayers don't pass the pew let alone the ceiling. We need you to do something new for us or we are just not going to make it, Lord. It's got to be something different. It's got to be something new. And we're asking and praying now earnestly for it. We need you, oh God. We want to receive you, oh God, right now. We pause and just await your spirit to come and touch our hearts. We lift up holy hands just waiting for your spirit to come and touch our hearts. Please, Lord, please touch our hearts. Unshackle our minds. Unshackle our minds and our thoughts right now. Help us to look to you and know that you have done it for us in the past. We wouldn't be here if you hadn't. Remind us of the time when we first met you. The excitement and the exuberance in our hearts when we first knew you. It was new. It was different. It was cutting edge. Remind us of those moments when we first prayed and felt your spirit fall upon our shoulders. Help us to understand that you still move today as you did then. Help us not to give up on seeking you daily. Help us to constantly press towards the mark. Help us to not give up, not to give in to the, the enemy and say, you know what, this thing is not working anymore. Forget it. We don't want to hear those words. We don't want to feel that sentiment. Lord, we need a fresh, new anointing. We won't leave until we get it. Just like that woman with the issue of blood, we're going to hold on until you give it. Just like Joseph, I'm going to hold on until I get it. You got to bless me. Jacob, I'm going to hold on until you bless me. Oh God, I'm going to hold on until you bless me. Father God, I'm going to hold on until you bless me. Lord, we all repeat together, we're going to hold on until you bless us. We're going to hold on until you bless us. Bless us, oh God. We need a fresh anointing, oh God. 
We praise you right now, Father God. In the name of your Son, the Messiah, we pray. Amen.